All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So this is a, a virtual tour or digital tour of multiplied edition mat and the transformable work of art through the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, my name is Jay Buchanan. I'm a student educator with the, with the Kemper. Um, I am also a master's student in the theater and performance studies program at WashU, um, working in a lot of different roles on campus. Um, but I'm really excited to share this work with you today, particularly because so many of the works are um, mobile or suggest motion. And so there is kind of a fun connection between art history and performance studies in this particular exhibition. We will get into some of the details of that in just a second. Um, and before we get started, too, I would just like to invite everyone. This is going to be as interactive as it can, can be. We're going to try our best to stimulate an actual museum tour. Um, so it, this is not something that should feel like me giving an art history lecture. I really want um, for you all to participate. So please go ahead now and make sure you can um, access the chat and go ahead and set where it, where it says two and there's a little drop down menu. Set that to all panelists and attendees and that way um, as I prompt you or, or just as you have thoughts about the work, you can share your thoughts, you can share your questions uh, with the group and I will also read those. Um, so yeah, we can we can sort of have as much of a conversation as possible, uh, trying our best to to treat this like we would um, if we were all actually together today. So we'll just start in case anyone is new to the museum or um, unfamiliar with it, with a quick look at the Kemper, the the sort of actual physical building. Um, the Kemper was designed by Fumihiko Maki, a Pritzker Prize winning architect. Um, and there was a remodel that was actually completed in 2019, the year that I first started at WashU. Uh, I was very lucky that that happened. I, I'm really glad that I've gotten to engage as deeply as I have with the Kemper in, in a year and a half I've been a student here. Um, but right, of course, COVID kind of messed everything up as far as the, the schedule goes. Um, so it's great that right this this remodel was completed. It was with Kieran Timberlake, a wonderful architecture firm. Um, and last semester, it opened with an exhibition by the the world renowned artist Ai Weiwei. Um, this is the second exhibition, actually the second rotating exhibition, to appear in the Kemper space since the remodel. Um, so again, very excited to share it with you. Um, before we start getting into the specifics of the edition mat history, uh, I just want to provide a little bit of overarching information. Um, Daniel Sherry was the artist who um, was kind of most responsible for edition mat uh, in its in its earliest iterations. Um, he was an artist as well as kind of an arts entrepreneur. So um, in 1959, he sort of coordinated the first iteration of edition mat, but we are going to look at three today um, because the, the the works of the, the sort of artists that were involved in the works um, got back together again after 1959 and 1964 and 1965 to kind of restage the concepts of, of this exhibition. So the work changed, but the guiding principles were kind of the same. Um, and the exhibition at the Kemper Multiplied presents sections, three sections, from um, those three different exhibitions. So this is actually the first time that all of this work has been together stateside. Um, it's shown, you know, of course, together in Europe in, in the actual history of the exhibitions. Um, but but right, like this is a this is kind of a revolutionary moment for this particular set of artworks. Um, and it's something that's yeah, just really special about it. Um, the curator Meredith Malone, who works at the Kemper put it together and also um, edited a really wonderful catalog for it um, that, that offers really in-depth historical information and kind of puts together a narrative of all of this work. Um, but in any case, we'll go ahead and get started now with, with the nitty gritty of the actual show. Um, this first set of works that I am, am showing now is in um, one of our galleries at, at the Kemper. It's this sort of the, this idea of transformable art. Um, Daniel Sherry brought that idea forward um, in collaboration with Gallery Edvard Loeb in Paris. And so the works that you see here um, are by a number of different artists, some of them really well established folks like Marcel Duchamp, who we'll see, uh, Man Ray, this, this squiggly silver object right here. 
um, was produced by Man Ray, who's a very famous surrealist um, who make a lot of films as well as art projects. But, but right, really big names involved and then a number of emerging artists were also involved. So there was a kind of democratizing impulse, um, both for artist contributors as well as for art buyers or art consumers or just gallery goers more generally. Um, the idea behind this show is that the works are certainly transformable, meaning that they might contain a certain kernel of motion or mobility, um, but they are also intended to be purchasable um, and, and also somehow experientially accessible as well as financially accessible to a wider audience than most art galleries tend to cater to. Um, in this first section, we are going to emphasize motion, though, um, as the kind of key organizing principles. And so there are kind of three sites of motion that we're going to look for in some case studies that I've chosen. So the first is by Marcel Duchamp, who's very famous for um, the 1916 work Fountain, which is a sort of illustrative of the ready-made, um, where he took a urinal and turned it on its side and called it an artwork. Um, and that sort of introduction of the quotidian to the art world uh, is often sort of remarked as like the foundation of contemporary sculpture or modern and contemporary sculpture. Um, and yeah, it, it's really it's really interesting to see that he contributed work to Edition Matt uh, because by, by the late 1950s, he's extremely well established, extremely famous and rather old as well. Um, so for the show, he revisited a work um, that he first attempted in 1935. Um, he called this a roto relief. And I'm just going to go ahead now as a test for the chat. I'm going to just ask, um, where do you think that the motion is located in this work? Any ideas? I picture the white segment of the edge as rotating around the outer circle. So thinking about this part right here in the center, out here. Gotcha. Uh, so scooting all the way around the side. That's an interesting guess. I like that. It's tricky to tell. Um, and thank you very much for your engagement. Um, it's tricky to tell where the motion is located without being able to see it in person, unfortunately. But in fact, there is actually, um, so kind of behind this, this self mounting piece, this black square there's um ac there's actually a motor so this work spins itself um and you can see all of these circles here um kind of in, in conversation with one another as the object just spins in a circle uh so if you were looking at this work in the Kemper, you'd be able to see it live every every so often they, all the all the different works that do move on motors in the exhibition are set to timers uh, that are kind of specified uh, just to the safety of the work, um, trying to both celebrate the, the, the life of the work, the thing it was intended to do without also you know, damaging it for future generations. Um, Sharon in the chat said something about flatness versus depth, and I think that that's a really important point here, Sharon, because right, this work is flat. It's, it's kind of like, um, almost like one of those fans that has a handle. Um, and, but it but it suggests a kind of depth, and when you're watching it in motion, it really looks like conical almost. It has a, a like this sort of perspective. I'm not exactly sure how to I'm not exactly sure how to describe it. Um, and so yeah, I think that that's really important. Um, the work is a lithograph. It's on a cardboard disc. Um, and right, the, the electric motor is kind of hidden behind. Uh, so right, this is a this is a sort of forerunner of 
um, the idea of the multiple. This one is uh, right. It's a transforming work, and Sherry sees this as a sort of emblematic of what he would like um, transformable art and edition that to be. Um, so as we move ahead here. Jesus Rafael Soto was an emerging artist at the time of Edition Matte in its first iteration in 1959. Uh, and in this work, Spiral or Spiral, um, what do you think now? I mean, this one does not contain a motor. So where do you think that the motion is located in Soto's piece? We're walking by. Yeah, that's a great guess. Are there any other thoughts? I mean, that there's that's definitely right, Lauren. It, it has something to do with the the body of the spectator. Thinking just a little bit more specifically, it's really an optical motion. So for this work, Soto has um, screen printed spirals both on plexiglass on the front here, so you can see. Um, I wanted to point at the work. <laughs> uh, you can kind of see it, the outline of the plexiglass here. Um, and then this white line indicates a spiral that he painted on it. Um, behind that, there's a piece of plywood, and it's painted white with black spirals on it. Um, and so, right, they're activating negative spaces in each other's images um, in a way that, that, right, kind of plays like, um, like those puzzles or tablecloths that are a little bit holographic. Um, it, it's like, right, you can, you can see multiple pictures at once. Um, and so as, right, as you move through the gallery, as you look at this from different angles, um, you can, or, or even as you look at this with different angles of light showing on the work, um, you're going to see a, a different thing as these spirals kind of converse with one another. Um, and just to give you a sense of about how big this is, this work is about 19 by 19 inches, uh, just so that there's a little bit of scale to think about. Any questions about Soto's work? All right. So then the last one that we're going to look at from this initial set of works um, is actually a Dieter Roth called Gummibandbild, uh, which means rubber band picture. The one that we have is from 1961. Um, and that, that sort of difference in dates between the, the actual very organized exhibition in 1959 and 1961 is important uh, because, right, I, I think I mentioned this before, but just in case I didn't, the works in Multiplied are all multiples, meaning that the artists were asked to make more than one. So the point was not to create some kind of masterpiece that would be sold for extremely high dollar. The idea was to make something that could be easily reproduced so that many people could own one um, and so that the price could be lower. Um, and so, right, with this, we see like there, there was one of these Gummibond Guilds rubber band pictures in the 1959 exhibition. Um, but as the works were fabricated for edition mat as, as multiples um, over the ensuing years, this is, a, this is an example from a later point. Um, so the specific objects are less important than the kind of transformable concepts or the multipliable concept. Um, and I did just want to point that out. But for this one, there's a sort of, I think it's a little bit clearer than the other two actually, but I will go ahead and ask if you want to go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, how do you see movement as a part of Gummy Bun Guild? vibration of some kind. I like that. You might think just a little bit simpler, but that's a very good guess. And in fact, I hadn't even thought about vibration, but I think that that's definitely true. Mm 
these works kind of form a make your own picture um, because the rubber bands are unfixed. So they're literally, it's just a board with a grid of nails on it. And then a whole bunch of rubber bands kind of attached on there. But the spectator or the owner of the work can move those rubber bands around however they want to. Um, so it's about 39 inches, 39 and a half inches square. Um, but right, like the, the picture itself is entirely mobile and that motion is located in the hand of the spectator. Um, so again, we're, now we're thinking with three different kinds of motion in each of these works, optical, embodied, and motorized, mechanical. In the chat, we're, I'm seeing uh, the shadows on the board too, the nails and bands, definitely. I mean, there's, right, there's going to be motion, um, kind of the image of motion will occur on the work, um, both as you're organizing the object and, right, like as they are kind of existing in, in tension. So those are the three works from the initial edition that show um, in Paris at Gallery Edward Bope that I'm going to talk about today. And before we move on, I do want to ask, are there any questions regarding, um, regarding history or regarding any of these objects? Um, I'm not sure actually if they're if the, if this is the original rubber band pattern first displayed. I don't think so. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the original looked like. Um, but this is, I guess, like we have not been. I don't think we've been playing with them or anything like that at the Kemper, though. Um, so it's possible that our installer put them on in this manner, and and maybe that was indirect reference to. Um, how the how the owner of the work actually has them maybe the owner of the work just left them on there for shipping um but there is this funny way that right as these are all loan works um this particular piece it, it, it kind of right it kind of loses a little bit of its original character in showing at the kemper um in this kind of museum exhibition context because really this is a work that's kind of right supposed to be in your house that you're supposed to be able to kind of fiddle with um and adjust so so right i'm not sure the last time the rubber bands moved um i don't think i saw them move at all in in the earlier tours that i did at the kemper um because i know folks are not supposed to touch them there um but it's definitely it's definitely possible that this reflects an original image lauren and it's a great question i, I think i think not though um, and perhaps the point of the work is, is right to kind of question um, the importance of originality or the importance of permanence of the image in an artwork. Um, so really generative question. Thank you so much. From a conservation perspective, rubber bands seem like a challenge to maintain. I completely agree with you um, because, right, eventually they're going to get tired. So. Right. If there, if you are to retain any tension, I guess you do probably have to switch them out. But there again, I'm not sure um, as the as the rubber bands themselves are exchanged. I'm not sure how much adjustment has been made to the image since sort of the initial run of the show and the acquisition of, of the multiple versions. Great question. Um, I think just in the interest of time, I am going to go ahead and move on to the second iteration. But of course, there will be time for questions at the end, and I'm happy to, to continue taking questions as they emerge. Um, so this one, we sort of think of as variations on a theme in 1964. So over the intervening five years between 1959 and 1964, um, the idea of kinetic and optics art becomes a lot more popular, both in Europe and in the United States. Uh, Schwery becomes a significantly more established artist, and a number of the artists that initially participated in Edition Matt also become increasingly um, famous or notorious in the art market, uh, however you choose to see it. Um, so those are, it, it's not necessarily the case that Edition Matt made those artists famous, um, but right, like this, this exhibition catches a lot of people um, at different points in their career 
And for emerging artists, a lot of them catch edition that on the rise. So by 1964, um, the, the work is more popular and there's a little bit of a like backed by popular demand kind of thing happening. So Daniel Sperry um, had been working on edition mat and on hand multiplying all of the works contributed by different artists for a couple of years after the first showing in Paris um, and it got the attention of a number of people. Uh, he was beginning to grow tired of working on, on multiplying his art and others' art. Um, and he was approached by Carl Kirstner, who's a graphic designer from Germany, um, who was really excited by Edition Matt, really excited by the rise in kinetic and optical art, uh, who actually connects him with a new gallery in Cologne, Germany, called Gallery der Spiegel. Um, this work kind of moves away from an original in series concept, and, and now it's not about um, precise replication of work. So it's not that Marcel Duchamp gives Schwery a roto relief and then Schwery makes a hundred roto reliefs for sale. It's rather um, the like formation of a conceptual grounding for a work that can then be reproduced so that the aesthetics of the work may change significantly, but the concept behind the work could in, in some ways retain the same title. Um, and you'll see the ways that this plays out. Um, but right, this, this, has, this marks a bit of a change. Um, the works are still very affordable, kind of modestly priced at this point. So they're usually somewhere between 90 and $150 for one of the multiples. Um, and I will note too, just before we get started, that the first edition that it didn't get a ton of attention, it, it sort of got some. Um, this variations on a theme got a great deal more attention and so edition that at gallery der spiegel in 1964 um and it got really mixed reviews from critics a lot of whom called it snobby arts and crafts uh which you know i'll leave you to decide how you feel about that interpretation as we look at some of these um snobbery aside i think a connection to arts and crafts is actually pretty apt um so this is one of my favorite works in the exhibition, and we actually also have one of these Hubels in the Kemper collection permanently. Um, so I included it on permanent collection tours before edition that started. Um, but I'm really excited to share this one with you. I just think that it's fun and kind of cheeky. Um, it's called Hubel. It means trash can or trash. Um, this is done by a French artist named Armand, who's associated with the Nouveau Realists. Um, Um, so right, this is a vitrine, and it's full of garbage. So, yeah, like that's, I mean, that's quite simply, I think, like full stop, there's something pretty fun about that. Um, he wanted the works to be filled with garbage at the gallery. Um, so he wanted the, or he wanted the gallerists to go out, get garbage, and put it in the vitrine he had provided. So this is the guiding concept in Hubel's. Um, and, and there are three showing at the Kemper at this time, or three, yeah, three sort of in the exhibition. Um, and they do all look very different. Uh, and yet, right, all of them are still trash can. They are still conceptually linked um, to Armand's idea. So he wanted the trash to be from out in Cologne, out in, in the city in Germany where, where this work was showing. He wanted there to be references to time and place, so like little scraps of newspapers and posters and wrappers and that sort of thing that would that would give it like a specific spatiotemporal character. Um, the galleries didn't really do that. They actually just put gallery garbage into the vitrines. Uh, and so you see a lot of really beautiful colors. You see like little ripped out pieces of books and brochures. You see napkins and, and flyers, uh, but there is actually a degree right still of like gallery content or kind of high art content even in the garbage, which is a, a really funny thing to think about. Uh, you can see the word gallery right there on this. So the, right, this, this particular Hubel has, um, it has actual reference to the art world inside it. Uh, and again, I think there's a little bit of, of cheekiness happening there. There's not only the idea that trash could be elevated to the level of art, 
but also the idea that um that right like that that the gallery is in the trash can um is kind of a i don't know just kind of a funny remark um armand did all kinds of other sculptural and assemblage works um which sort of just combined little quotidian things um one of my favorites is called little bourgeois scraps it has little pencils and stuff like that in it um but right in general the idea is to think about kind of the excess in, associated with consumerism um the wastefulness and the selectivity with which those things are curated by by galleries and museums a lot of times um when in fact right like the byproducts of consumption no matter how kind of desirable or beautiful it might be is always waste um and so there is always this this stuff left over um I wonder if you can if you can see closely enough. Unfortunately, I can't I can't get um, a great zoom for us today. But if you can just maybe throw in the chat really quickly one of the objects that you see, one of the items that intrigues you, um, you can do your best to describe it. Maybe just let's say a max of five words. Try to just identify one thing that stands out in this piece for you. One looks like maybe a takeout container, but I can't tell it's white with red on it. That's a good point. I'm not sure if that's right, if that's a flyer, but if you're talking about this one right here, there's also this down here. Um, it's not, yeah, it's so much harder to talk about works that are just assemblages of garbage when I can't point my finger at them in front of you to confirm. But, um, but right, like there's, there's all these little details and in particular, right, like references to food, um, which again, like is, you know, at the very base level, what consumption means. Um, yeah, mail envelopes all over the place. So it's a lot of like letter paper and stationery and envelopes um, and postage. And that makes a lot of sense. A gallery is, is a business place. Um, and so there's going to be all kinds of mail like that, um, mail, typewriter stuff. Um, but that's going to be gallery trash. Thanks for pointing those out, y'all. I mean, I think, right, there's like some green kind of wrapping or tape right here. Um, postcards maybe included like up here. Uh, I think that this might be an eraser, um, but I could be confusing it with another one of the people. Um, anyway, thanks for, for participating with me. I really like this one. Like I said, I just think it's fun. Um, and right, just for just for reference, this is about five inches deep, it's four and seven eighths inches deep, um, twenty eight and an eighth in inches long, and twenty and a quarter inches wide. Um, so not huge, but right, a sort of familiar art gallery sized object. And then we're going to look here now at a work by Daniel Sperry. Um, it's an art multiplier. So he, here is our organizer actually contributing a work to the show. Um, quick, before I start talking about it, tell me one thing that catches your eye in this one. It's a little clearer here than in the, in the Fubel. Just the first object you see or saw, a clothing hanger. Yeah, okay, I'm seeing blocks, pens and pencils, maybe a puzzle piece, something, these little magnet guys, that I'm not sure exactly what those are. Um, there's like jacks, coins, um, those, those loop hangers, like the, or the looped like screws that you can, you can suspend things from. Um, maybe like spools of thread, a little like horse shaped toy. So it's really, again, really simple. Um, yeah, so the, right, they're board game pieces, I think. 
um, either that or like little action figures at one or the other, but they're, they're childhood toys, um, largely. And so, right, this is like, again, relating to the Armon, um, it's kind of an assemblage of random things. Uh, most of these do in some way reflect a kind of nostalgia and like, like childishness. And I think the color really contributes to that. Um, but, but right, like there's, right, there's a lot of memories and, and like this idea of play, which in many ways infuses with addition that in all three of its iterations, Daniel Sperry's idea for this was uh, in some way to, to write, like play with the idea of what art could do um, and to think about ways to like institutionalize play in art making in certain ways. Um, so yes, he basically threw down these items in or like like looked up um and like those like saw where where all these little random things were on the table in front of him at one point uh and then he like transitioned them onto this mirror glued them in place and then restaged that on the opposing mirror so the idea here right again like armand really playing with the idea of originality and kind of like sloughing it off um, there's this idea of like the artwork being restageable. Um, works by Robert Rauschenberg, like Factum, do this, and and there are um, works by Rauschenberg in the Kemper collection too. The next time you're able to visit, I would I would definitely recommend checking those out. Um, but right, and it's not just reproduced um, in Sherry's active like restaging and regluing onto a second mirror. It's also restaged in the reflection, so that we're actually seeing the image that we're seeing in four separate planes at one time, um, all in conversation with one another. And so thinking about the image being located in something other than what the artist's hand has touched is also, I think, a really interesting wrinkle of this work. Um, that right, like we're seeing both a reflection um, and we're seeing, we're see yeah, we're seeing a combined image, which is all of the, so, so the, the random placement the deliberate placement and the reflected placement, as well as the combination of those. Um, and we can try our best to like mentally isolate them. Um, but in some respects, we have this like totalizing object that's all of those things at one time. And we can't really envision what it would be like um, at any of those individual steps in the process. And yet, conceptually, we can identify them. Um, and so this is this is the work that kind of inspired the show in 1964. Um, the move uh, again away from works that are um, transformable and replicatable, specifically um, as like as new art objects, but rather right like moving to this um, this original in, in series concept, uh, so that so that this idea could be multiplied over and over again with entirely different objects um, in any case. Are there any questions about Sherry's art multiplier or Spiegel object, mirror object? I don't want to move ahead too quickly, but we are about to shift into the last iteration. All right, great. So with this one, it's in some respects a panorama of contemporary art by 1965. There's a great deal more engagement between European artists and American artists, and some Americans contribute um, to the 1965 iteration. By now, one year after the 1964 Gallery Der Spiegel revival of edition that multiples have caught on as a kind of global art market phenomenon. So um, in some respects, the gang kind of gets back together one final time. Um, and again, also, you know, so new work, new artists join the fray in each of these iterations too, so that it's, it's never exactly a collective. It's really a, like an assemblage of individual parts, um, thinking about both the group of artists as well as the works themselves. Um, so this time they make small works in additions, um, yet again. 
the pricing is still a lot less than is standard market value for any of these sort of blue chip big name artists. Uh, but it's a lot less financially accessible than it was uh, in 1959 or in 1964 um, because the gallery, Gallery Der Spiegel, is realizing that like they would like to, they would like to make more money, and this is something successful, um, and so they want to be able to to really like profit from it. Uh, and actually, I know um, there there has been some discussion of that in the process of curating the show because some of the works. Um, have been in like in storage with Gallery Der Spiegel for a long, long time, um, just like being held <laughs> on on consignment. Um, in any case, so right, lots of big name artists get involved, and later in 1965, after this set of work is shown in Cologne, um, the multiple kind of has a, a big emergence in the United States. So Marion Goodman, an art dealer, and Barbara Kulik, who is an artist, um, co-found Multiples Inc., which is an organization that was designed like exclusively to produce multiples in the idea of Sperry's um, kind of initial one-man workshop doing it. Um, but this would have, you know, many more employees kind of funded by art world elites and uh, like like really a, like a corporatized almost um, production chain for all these different works, um, which is in some respects a really far cry from the initial work, uh, and in other ways, right, like like reflects a pretty natural progression um, that like the, in terms of the consumption and replication that mark 50s domestic life in America and in Europe. Um, and so, right, the, the kind of evolution from really democratized, really accessible to like slightly more taste-based, slightly more hierarchical, in some respects makes a lot of sense. There was a huge boom in the 50s in consumption and, and a massive increase in quality of life on the one hand, um, with also right a certain degradation perhaps of ideas about authenticity, um, as well as ideas about like universal rights of access to that quality of life and to that kind of conspicuous consumption. Um, in any case, I've, I've rambled a bit about this one, um, and it's kind of milieu, but, but by 1965, like, this is a, this is a bit of a brand. This is not so, um, so radical or so different anymore. Um, it's, it's kind of variations on the theme again, and it's, it's exploring a, a strategy they know to work. Um, so one of my favorite examples, Armand, who did the trash can work from the 1964 iteration of Edition Matt, presents Shuha shoes. Um, this is literally a shoe cut in half and then mounted on mylar. Um, so here we're seeing, I think, uh, again, like a connection to Duchamp, a connection to Man Ray, that like, this is a ready-made. This is the idea that this everyday object is an artwork. Um, so it's a shoe, and we know it's a shoe, like we can kind of tell somehow from the physical structure that it's a shoe. Um, this also harkens back to the 1959 element of motion as kind of core to Edition Matt's aesthetics, uh, because we're right, like shoes facilitate or they like index walking, they, they are for your feet, they're, they're a part of um, thinking in a very kind of conventional and like like one kind of body centric way, um, right? Like thinking about walking as human mobility at its most fundamental. So shoes are directly connected to that. They are a tool for walking. Um, and so therefore they are connected um, to like this motion impulse. Uh, and it's true. There's a way in which the mylar makes it look like they're frozen as they might be kind of falling out of the sky or like dropped out of a window or, or something like that. Um, one fun question that this one brings up for me, and right, it's like kind of shoe size for their record. It's only about 13 inches tall and about 17 inches wide all the way across. Um, and then the, the vitrine is only like two or two and three quarters inches deep. Um, so the question that comes up for me is like, even though we can recognize the image of a shoe here, is it still a shoe anymore? Um, you're welcome to throw your thoughts in the chat, but I'll just like nerd out about this for a second. I think it's funny. Like, is a shoe still a shoe if it doesn't work? 
like a shoe because if you cut a shoe in half it it won't stay on your foot so like what's the point of wearing it um and it seems to me that shoes are kind of functionally defined so like you have shoes so that you can wear them on your feet so that you can walk um or so that at least your feet are protected and right like this shoe would not do shoe stuff it wouldn't do the work of a shoe anymore um and so here again like with a very simple aesthetic intervention i feel like arman is um is really doing something very cheeky um being kind of mischievous with us here um asking us to think about like like what is a ready-made um does it really matter uh and again just like maybe slapping off the idea that authenticity or artist intentionality even is really all that important because there's nothing about this work other than the fact of the shoe being cut in half that indexes Armand's involvement at all. Um, happy to take any thoughts on that one, but I will go ahead and move on to our last work for the day. Um, this is Christo's look from 1965. Um, you might be familiar with Christo, like this is a, he's a very, very famous artist. He and his wife, Jean-Claude, did all kinds of, of really, really large scale installations together until her um, death. And uh, one of those was a repellent fence, which was on the U.S.-Mexico border, a uh, big kind of yellow balloon eyes. I don't know if anyone who is in the tour today was at Isla Sharon, um, our historian on campus. She, she did a talk earlier this week called Redrawing the Frontera, which is about the, the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and so Christo was involved there. Um, and Christo also installed like a, there's a whole documentary done on it. So like a giant like golden structure that connected three islands in off the coast of Italy. Um, and people could walk between them over water. Um, so it's it's really interesting to me to see how his career evolved after edition that and he was already successful by 1965 um but he he went on to do these like gigantic sort of monumental but temporary installations um this work feels very different from that to me and this one it's look magazine it's a united states magazine that really kind of is is like directly associated with consumer culture in the u.s um it's wrapped in plastic, mounted on wood, and then tied up in cord. Um, and so, yeah, he's a, he, like Armand, is really changing the function of this object. Like, we can't look at the magazine, we can't read it, we can't flip through the pages of it. We don't, we don't know how many there are. Um, so this, this thing that is supposed to be dynamic and is supposed to provide us with, um, with information, possibly with entertainment, is in many ways made opaque despite the fact that this object is marked by transparency. So we can't get through to the meanings that are contained within the magazine. We have to experience the magazine just as an object. Um, and that's something that, again, is I think really interesting. Um, so it's making a multiple, because there were several editions of Look, um, of Christo's Look, but it's making a multiple out of a thing that it's already mass produced kind of like the shoes um and so here in this one it looks like it's falling and and the question again is like is it still like is there something is there is there an essential magazine -ness? is there something that makes a magazine a magazine um is it the fact that you're able to read it um is or is the image of a magazine still a magazine uh, and like, right, I'm not sure if we're going to answer those questions together today, but I think that that kind of, that's the kind of philosophical depth that this project plunges, um, even as, right, like these, these works are extremely simple to produce. Um, and just a fun story about this one to end our tour on today before I take some questions from y'all. Customs agent thought that the first set of these that Christo shipped to um, Galerie der Spiegel in Cologne were not art. They, they didn't recognize them as art. And so they actually like unwrapped them and took them apart. So they weren't mounted to be put on the wall until the first set came to the gallery all torn up. The art was broken um, because customs agents thought that it was just a magazine shipment and they were, they were like just opening up to make sure everything was okay. Um, 
because right it started off just as this like plastic bundled cord wrapped magazine and after that the gallery asked the show to send um others mounted so that at, at the very least custom agents would understand that they were not supposed to deconstruct the thing um but i just think that that's really funny because right like here we are questioning what is an art object what is a magazine is a magazine still a magazine if it's made just into an art object um and like right customs and border patrol is there to to like it, you know ostensibly to protect the citizens of a, a particular nation and to protect like the the ecosystem of that space um by filtering out things um according to like really rigid classification systems and their classification system was not supple enough to to take in this magazine as object as artwork um and so i just think that that's kind of a fun place to stop um there are so many works in addition that um in multiplied that are worth seeing um if you're able i would recommend that you look into getting one of these this is edition at the catalog um that was produced by the kimber for this exhibition um edited by curator meredith malone and it's absolutely fantastic um, you can find a lot more resources about it on the Kemper's website if you're interested. Um, and yeah, I will hang out here for the next five minutes or so, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions if, if you have them. But thank you so much for joining me today to look at Edition Nat. Um, I really appreciate it. I know it's a, a funny time here at lunch on Friday, um, but it's been really fun to talk about them with you. <laughs>